arrogance. The fact is, is that it's God's word that breaks in to say something, as opposed to one person actually being, in essence, innocent and the other guilty. I mean, look at it this way. You have these two characters. They both come up to the temple to pray, literally. I mean, they're walking up a hill. And at least the inference from the Greek is, is that the Pharisee sort of knows his way around. He sort of strives right in. He's been here before. He knows where his place is. And where is it? It's up here. And he makes his way and begins to pray. He prays not in the way that would be more acceptable. Because, you see, in temple worship, almost everybody prayed out loud. And so you didn't want a dominant voice. Because I'm praying right here, and if I'm like here, then he's praying right beside me. He's, we're both standing up. And you know, if somebody's loud on one side of you, you can't hear yourself think. So the courtesy was that everybody would speak rather softly. Because they were, in fact, praying out loud. That was the posture. It, it is a new thing. In essence, in the history of spirituality, to think more around, it's all inside of my head and I don't say anything about that. That's, that's, that's not typically Hebraic. Instead, if you're going to pray, you might quietly ponder, but when you actually step up to talk to God, you literally step up, you are standing, and you're speaking out loud. But because you know that God surrounds everything that is everywhere, you don't need to yell to get His attention. Because he's, he's right here. So, but the Pharisee, at least the indicator is, is probably speaking a little bit more loudly than he should. So he's already calling attention to himself. Everybody knows who he is because of his dress. Sort of like this. If I came in like this, you'd either think I was a bishop or it was Halloween. <laughs> so, people already know who he is. There's a certain level of deference that happens when he walks in. People sort of get out of the way a little bit. He takes his place. He is up front. He begins to pray. Now, here's what begins to happen, though. This is the part of what makes it complicated. To say that this man is a Pharisee already means that he's in great standing in the temple. He's not a man of questionable character, in other words. At least that's what the listener would assume when Jesus would tell the story and then he's up here and that he's praying so far, they're tracking. Of course, that's exactly what he would do. But then when he begins to indicate that it's subtle, that maybe he's raising his voice a little higher than he should, ooh, that's when people go, he wasn't trained to do that. And then notice, he actually refers to himself five times within the course of his very small prayer. Now, no Pharisee would do that. You see, if you're standing up to pray, you're talking to God. You're not talking about yourself. And if you're following the Hebraic pattern, not only are you talking to God, the content of at least the first five minutes of your prayer is about God, God's character, what God, who God is, the blessings that God pours out, who He is as magnificent and holy, creator of the universe, all of those things. I mean, that's why, for example, when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, the first phrase is not about me. It's, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. In other words, it's about you, your kingdom come. It's, it's not about, in the beginning, my need at all. <coughs> and so when he begins, sort of jumps in. Oh, God, I fast twice a week, etc., etc., etc. At this point, people that are around him are kind of going, what's he doing? Who let him in? Because it is entirely out of character with how a Pharisee would pray. Now, of course, all the things that he mentions, good things. He fasts, he gives his money away. He's all they would be admirable. And in fact, the way they're described is a description of him actually being so devout that he goes above and beyond what the law requires of him. So, at least in terms of what he is saying out loud, he's exemplary, a model. 
Somebody who's gone way beyond the average, even Pharisee, in the things that he might do in expressing his devotion and his loyalty to God. But then there's this, what's he doing? What some younger people would say, the man has tuned, meaning attitude. We don't understand what's going on here. And so that's the man. Understand it's complicated. On the one hand, he's an exemplary figure. All the things that he describes about himself are noteworthy. But why is he keeping, why is he calling attention to himself? What's that about? What's the, what's the voice? All the things that sort of say, look at me, aren't I great? And of all things, saying that in essence to God. On the other hand, here's the other character. The tax collector. Now, a tax collector, by its very nature, means that he's in cahoots with the occupational government of Rome. He is not a good guy. In other words, there isn't anything about his job description that would indicate that he is worthy of any kind of personal praise at all. And in fact, when Jesus mentions that he's a tax collector, there might even be, have been, although they wouldn't do this, this is an anachronism. They might have decided, you know, not our kind of folk. But something unusual happens with the tax collector. And it has everything with, to do with his own, what we would call self awareness. Does he stride up front? No, no, he's actually hanging out. He's in probably what would be called then the court of the Gentiles. Even though every indication is the fact that he's a Jew and he's welcome right up here. Gentiles sat out there because they were not clean under the law, but they were able to come and pray. So he's out there someplace. Now that's unusual. And what does he do? Does he raise his voice? No, just the opposite. But he and the Pharisee have something in common. The focus is on their own. They both are talking about the focus of their own condition. But by contrast to the Pharisee, what's he doing? He's like this. What's he doing? He's doing this. And what are his words? God has mercy on me. What? A sinner. The word sinner in the scriptures is a confession. It means I know that I am not right with God. I know that there are things that I am doing that God has, does not in any way have God's approval at all. In other words, my sense is where I belong is right there, not in here. And then, so here we are. There, there's none of, neither of them would be people that we would make to you know, the hero in some sort of simplistic Christian movie plot. They're both complicated in that sense. So that when Jesus says that man, speaking about the tax collector, with whom justified, that's an anathema. Absolutely an anathema. In our hyperactive political climate, that would almost be, at least if this kind of attitude were expressed, Jesus saying that either, depending on your political preference, that either Hillary Clinton or Bill Trump was justified before God. <laughs> depending on where you are politically, that's a shocker statement. That begins to get at the reaction that some of Jesus' hearers would have had at, the, at God, him saying, who's justified? It's the tax collector, not the Pharisee. Because you see, again, people assume that if I was going to, in many, in some way, get, some ways, gain God's approval, that has to be acted out in my deeds. And the deeds that the Pharisee shows are exemplary. It's just his attitude that is just way out of line and out of characteristic for a Pharisee. So that's when we have to say, well, then what's Jesus? What's Jesus who thinks they hate in this parable? Because he commends 
a tax collector. Number one, to commend a tax collector says something really important. That all of us, if we are justified before God, that's the important one, if we are justified before God, are very much, to use a contemporary phrase, we are a mixed bag when it comes to our behavior. In other words, none of us, at least if, <laughs> at least if we're in some relationship with God at all, and our heart's involved, can never take the place of the Pharisee. Even, no matter how many tributes we get, plaques in our office that tell us about all the great stuff that we've done. That has, that has nothing to do, nothing to do, with whether or not we are gaining God's approval. What matters to God, in the midst of this mixed bag of saint and sinner, that is in fact inside all of us, is the fact that I am a debtor to God's mercy. I am never in the position of somehow claiming justification for God's approval in my life. For as Paul writes in Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is a common, common attribute for all of us. And so that the, in essence, the message of the parable is this comparison stuff has just got to stop. If you're somehow justifying yourself based on the misbehavior of someone else, well, if you want to compare them and me, you know, I got it hands down. Jesus says you're playing in the wrong ball field. That it's never about whether I'm better than someone else. If the focus is on God, not me somehow trying to assuage my conscience, because isn't, isn't that what we do? It's actually easier, instead of examining your own heart, to focus on the misdeeds of somebody else. And you may be absolutely right of, in your accurate assessment about somebody else's misdeeds. But what Jesus is trying to say in the parable is, you have missed the point. It's never about comparisons. Never. Because somebody's always going to be better than you. And somebody's always going to be worse than you. If you're talking about the scales of human behavior. <coughs> Instead, the focus is on my relationship with God. Where do I need God's forgiveness? Where do I need God to break through in my life? Where am I, in fact, a debtor to His mercy? Where do I need to walk into His presence with nothing in my hand that justifies in any way my right to be here? To say, God, it is on you, and unless you offer me your mercy and your justification, I am just sunk. That's the key to vindication. That's the key to God saying, welcome in. It's never a matter of whether or not I am good enough. It's always the act of God's mercy. Always. And for all of us. So that when we get into these tussles, whether we're talking about politics, whether we're talking about family squabbles, whether we're talking about relationships and who did what to whom. I mean, that is the description of the way most of our life gets occupied sometimes. And we also live in an age where the drivenness of the media culture in which we live really robs us of the capacity to have any kind of solitude with which to reflect on what's going on in my own heart. You, you know as well as I do, it is so easy to come into this service or any other service for that matter, and the whole focus becomes on making sure we do it right. And so we go through the motions, we do the whole thing, and in fact it may have gone pretty well after it was all over, but unless somehow there's been this heart-to-heart -heart contact between me and God, if there's been a transaction into which I have been invited, even if, even if it is what I kneel at the rail to receive the bread and the wine, 
in a way that allows me to know that I am in fact the heir of God's mercy. All I'm doing is creating a kind of pharisaical atmosphere where the emphasis is on behavior. I'm not sure that's particularly Christian, even if we use the name of Jesus. No. What binds us together as Christians is that we are, regardless of where we are in our walk, so to speak, we, are, we have one thing in common, and often one thing only. And that is, is that we can gather at the foot of the cross and know that we are, that the playing field has been entirely leveled. And that each one of us in that moment and in our lives is in fact the recipient. The recipient, not the earner, but the recipient of the mercies of God. And I want you to know that's what brings joy. To know that in the midst of this mixed bag, saint and sinner life in which I know so deeply, that to know that somehow by the mercy of God, I've been received and made His own. That God has claimed me. I belong to Him. And that I have, in fact, the companionship of His presence. No matter what's going on, because you see the commitment that Jesus makes when He says, I will never leave you or forsake you, is always predicated upon this mercy. Otherwise, I'm trying to figure out whether I've earned God's presence with me today or not. That's just psycho. I mean, it'll drive you crazy. At least if you care. But if I know that I walk in His forgiveness and His mercies, and that I am His, and that He, in fact, has claimed me as His own, so that no matter how many times I fall down, He'll pick me back up. He doesn't give up, in other words. That's a place of profound and deep assurance. That even gets exemplified in the commitments that these are going to make when they come up to make these vows. What's the answer? It is I will. No. It is I will with God's help. Because I need it. You see, that's the place of jewel. It's not, well, did you know what so-and-so did? Trying to make myself feel better. That's always scrappy, angry, and tense. No, the place of joy is, I belong. I'm welcome. And it's all based on the mercies of God. All, and always will be based on the mercies of God. So we make room for one another. We make allowances, as Paul writes, for one another because we love each other. Because we are all together objects of His mercy and His love. And it is out of that that we can say, yes, I will, with God's help, make the commitments that I made and find a way to be the person that God has called me to be in a world that is not interested in mercy, but only interested in justification. Let's be different. And be grateful for the profound mercies of God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, we who at one level are neither Pharisee or tax collector can, and because of this, come into your presence, open our hearts to you, and know that you do not turn us away, and that we are debtors, profound debtors, and that you love us and receive us and bring to us all of the forgiveness and mercy that we need, and more. So for such lavish love, and for such a deep place of peace, we're grateful, God. You're so grateful. And we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen.